All righty. Thank you guys so much for coming. We definitely appreciate it. Um, our guest today is from Bard College, where he serves as the director for the Center of Environmental <coughs> Policy and the MBA in Sustainability. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from Williams College and his um, PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, in recent years, he's coordinated climate action, climate action events for over 2,500 co colleges, universities, high schools, and other institutions across the country. Um, and today, he's here to present to us his lecture, Republicans, De Democrats, and Sustainability, Recovering Bipartisanism um, and Environmental Policies. So everybody, please welcome Eben Goodstein. Thank you, Brad. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. We had a good conversation earlier today about careers um, and getting a job, saving the planet. How many of you were at my earlier talk? So I get a sense. So most of you were. All right. So that's good. You won't be uh, 40. I can tell the same jokes more than once. Um, okay. So let's do a little poll here. How many uh, do you th of Col uh, Colgate students do you, uh, do you think that le less than 50% will vote? Hold up your hand. Uh, how many think 50 to 75% of Colgate students will vote? And how many do you think more than 75% will vote? Just curious. Okay, so 50 to 75% is your friends, you would say? Okay, that's pretty engaged for uh, uh, millennial uh, turnout. Uh, it's more likely to be something like 45% nationally, something like that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk tonight about politics and the environment and a little bit about why young people are so disengaged from uh, electoral politics. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk much about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton until the end because I really want to set the frame for how we got to where we got uh, more than uh, focusing on kind of the current issues. But we'll have some time to talk about, about the current election. Um, how many of you watched or heard sort of know the details of the debate last night, either from reading most people, okay, are kind of engaged in it one way or the other. All right. Um, so, introduction. Uh, I'm director of graduate programs in sustainability at Bard College, and we offer masters of science degrees in environmental policy and climate science and policy. Those are students who want to change the rules. That's their career focus. Um, we also offer uh, an M. We will be offering a masters of education in environmental ed. That's for folks who want to. You know, engage the next generation um, in these issues. And then finally, we have a new business degree, an MBA in sustainability down in New York City. Um, that's a low residency program where you can work 30 to 40 hours a week and uh, do an MBA program that uh, is really unique. Uh, there's only a few programs globally that do what we do, which is we fully integrate sustainability into a core business curriculum. So we teach economics, marketing, strategy, and accounting. But every class is wrapped around the idea of how do I build a mission-driven business? So how do I build a business that's in business to solve social and environmental problems? So if you'd like to talk with me more about these programs, I'm glad to hang around afterwards. Um, and uh, I'll also circulate the sign-up sheet here in a minute if you want to get on our mailing list to learn about these programs. Um, there are two Colgate students who have gotten their master's degrees in environmental policy, or I think they're both environmental policy. Uh, uh, Molly Gilligan graduated a couple years ago. Um, our, our master's program features or requires all students to do an extended professional internship, four to six month internship in the second year. And Molly went down to Washington, D.C. and interned at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, working in their Women in Development and Climate Change program. Um, and they liked her so much that they kept her on uh, in residence for a while, but she's actually moved out to Great Falls, Montana, um, and uh, works there now uh, remotely for IUCN, so she's continued to work with them. Lauren Frisch did her uh, internship uh, at the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, which ironically, even though it's miles from the ocean, many miles from the ocean, has an ocean uh, oceanographic department and uh, has been working on ocean acidification. Um, that's where she did her internship. Again, they liked her so much that they hired her on and she's actually stayed now for, I guess, three or four years uh, it's been since she graduated. So uh, our graduate programs, as you can gather, really feature a focus on professional engagement, experiential education, internships, both of our, uh, all of our programs. Um, and it's just really an important part, should be an important part of your graduate education 
regardless of where you go, because sustainability is not something you can learn uh, in the classroom. You really have to, it's a problem solving discipline, and you have to get out there and get your hands dirty one way or another. So, um, I'd love to talk to you, any of you more about this, and I want to invite you, if you're interested in this stuff, to come to Bard College. Bard's about uh, two hours more or less due east of here. It's 90 miles north of New York City on the Hudson. Um, we're going to have a weekend workshop where we focus on kind of skills training uh, for sustainability leadership careers. Uh, it costs 30 bucks. Uh, starts Friday afternoon at 4 or 5 and ends Sunday at noon. Um, and it's a really good network to be involved in. So um, those are the things you can sign up for if you like. I'll just go ahead and circulate these if people want more information. You can put your name down. We won't bombard you with emails, I promise. Okay, uh, on to politics. Uh, and the context for this talk is really about the reason that so many millennials are disengaged with politics. And that is, as far as you guys are concerned, uh, throughout your adult lives um, and late teenage years, the system has been broken. Uh, we are in this sort of profound gridlock in Washington, D.C., uh, um, and uh, the, the rhetoric around environmental issues, uh, and climate issues, as well as other social issues and economic issues, extremely partisan. Uh, D.C. is gridlocked to the point that you might have to go back to before the Civil War to find a point when there was less cooperation between political parties than, than you guys have experienced. And that's enough to turn kind of lots of people off and make them feel like, you know, the whole system is, is sort of broken. Um, but kind of the starting point for our talk tonight is that that's really not the way it's been, especially on environmental issues, through much of the 20th century. That, in fact, uh, the, much of the 20th century was defined by uh, cross-aisle and bipartisan cooperation beginning really 100 years ago with Teddy Roosevelt, the foundation of the national parks, um, and then moving on quickly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s of, of sort of impressive legislative feats of the creation of an environmental um, and natural resource protection legislative framework that was, you know, unprecedented and, and put the U.S. in, 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 in sort of in, the, in, in, in a role of global leader that other countries follow. Okay? So um, that's what defined most of the 20th century, and this gridlock that we're experiencing is very recent, actually, only eight years old, really, if you want to really put your fingers on it. Um, so we're in an, an extraordinary time. So if you go back to when I was 10 years old, uh, 1970, the first Earth Day, um, that day there were actually 20 million Americans in the streets, uh, in cities and towns all across the country. 20, 20, you mentioned 20 million Americans? It's double the population of New York City. Uh, 20 million Americans haven't done anything together since Earth Day, right? Uh, and it, politically. Um, and what this was about, you know, was folks celebrating the Earth, but also demanding action on what the time were very severe local environmental problems. So you guys have seen pictures of Shanghai and Beijing, so you know what really severe air pollution looks like. And U.S. cities weren't that bad, but they were pretty bad, air quality. Uh, we had really bad and obvious water pollution problems to the point that uh, rivers like the Cuyahoga River in Ohio or Cleveland were, were catching on fire, uh, very famously. Heard that story before? From Cleveland. Oh, you, you know about the Cuyahoga, okay. Um, and, and just litter. Just garbage. I mean, people, when I was a kid, used to throw stuff out the window, just by the side of the road, dump mattresses everywhere. So we had just, you know, very obvious and local environmental problems. And this was, you know, what motivated people, really, to get out in the streets and, and demand action. And this led to uh, uh, Republican President Richard Nixon uh, citing a, a, a whole series of major environmental initiatives, um, including the uh, creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, the Dangerous Species Act, uh, legislation that passed the Senate and House on a bipartisan basis. Uh, this activity continued uh, in the 1980s under conservative President Ronald Reagan. Uh, we had the passage of Superfund legislation that mandated cleanup of toxic waste dumps around the country, uh, the toxic release inventory that required chemical companies to uh, reveal what they were 
pumping out of their stacks and out of their pipes. Um, and then we also had an international treaty signed under Reagan's watch. Um, and this was to uh, phase out uh, chlorofluorocarbons and other chemicals that were destroying the ozone layer, uh, which protects us from harmful UV radiation. Uh, and, um, and all those things happened under Ronald Reagan. And this kind of bipartisan cooperation continued actually into the 1990s with the first President Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, who in 1990 signed the Clean Air Act amendments that um, actually required coal plants to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide by over 50% uh, to attack the acid rain problem, and also required those chemical companies to start reducing the toxic emissions from their stacks. And finally, the last act under the Bush, Bush 1 administration was the signing of another international treaty. Um, uh, this was the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It was signed at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. It was negotiated by, by Bush's team, uh, uh, ratified on a bipartisan basis in the U.S. Senate, and then signed into law by, by Bush. This treaty did a number of things. It created a scientific body, IPCC, that reports every year on this, or every five years on the consensus science around climate change. But it also set up an annual meeting of the parties called the Conference of the Parties, the COP meetings, that happen every year where the members, all the countries that are part of this treaty get together and figure out are we making progress towards the initial goal of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was to stabilize global warming pollution uh, at a level that was safe in the environment. And you may know that last December in Paris, uh, President Obama uh, agreed to and signed off on the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which is historic in that for the first time, this was COP21, this was the 21st meeting of the parties. Um, and at COP21, this was the first time that all the countries of the world actually agreed to take action to reduce emissions of global warming pollution. Okay. So it was actually under the authority of that treaty that Bush signed back in 92 that Obama met with all the heads of states and they agreed to this kind of action. Okay. So we had this burst of kind of incredible legislative action out of Washington, bipartisan support for action. But if you look, that was 25 years of that. But if you look from 1993 to today, the last 25 years about has there been major legislation on the environment out of D.C.? And, and the answer is no. Uh, really nothing much has come out of Washington for the last 25 years um, on the environment. Um, and, uh, and that is sort of set in motion as kind of creating the dynamic of gridlock in D.C. that really has turned off so many people, um, not just young people. Okay. And, and to now we're at this point where uh, if we look at climate change, which, you know, sort of in many ways dwarfs all other environmental challenges that humans have ever faced, we get uh, one candidate saying global warming is a total and very expensive hoax, although he said last night that he never said that, but he, this is actually a direct quote, uh, so he did actually say that, a direct tweet. That. Um, uh, and the other candidate saying, Climate change is an urgent threat and a defining challenge of our time. It's very hard to imagine two political parties, two candidates uh, as far apart on uh, a critical environmental issue as that. So, so how do we, what happened? How do we move from bipartisan cooperation to partisan gridlock? And you can actually see these trends really clearly um, in, in the data uh, at the level of national politics. So, so this is data that shows um, at the top here we've got um, uh, de Democrats in the Senate and House. The solid line is the, is the Senate. Dash line is the House. And down here are Republicans. And these are the percentage of times on average that Democrats and Republicans vote in favor of what the League of Conservation Voters calls pro-environment votes. Okay? Um, and according to the League of Conservation Voters, uh, you know, if you look at the period 1970 to about 1991, 92, Democrats are voting, you know, 50 to 60 percent of the time in favor, on average, of pro-environment votes, and Republicans are voting 30 to 40 percent of the time, on average, in favor of 
pro-environment votes. So because these are averages, there's some Republicans up here and there's some Democrats down there, and so you can kind of see that there's a fair amount of overlap in the political positions that allowed for bipartisan support for these initiatives. But you can also see really clearly after about 1991 this divergence, what Fred Rich, author, calls the great estrangement. So that by 2014, 15, Republicans are voting, you know, 0 to 10 percent of the time in favor of pro-environment votes. And Democrats are voting 90 to 100 percent of the time. So party sorting, if you will. Conservative Democrats are disappearing. Uh, moderate Republicans are disappearing. Okay. You can also see the data in public opinion. Oh, I can use this. Okay. Uh, so if we look at what's happening with the public, um, the Gallup poll has been asking the question, do you agree with the statement that national spending on environmental protection is too little? Do you agree with that statement? Okay. And they've been asking that question every year for the last, what, 40 years? Um, and so if we go back to 1974, 68% of Democrats agreed with that and 58% of Republicans. So about a 10 percentage point gap. Um, and during recessions, support for the environment drops off, picks up again. And then in 1990, uh, you had 75% of both Democrats and Republicans identical saying that spending on the environment was too little. That was right when the global warming issue was hitting the paper. So it was two years after Jim Hansen's sort of famous testimony. Lots of concern about the environment because of this revelation that the planet was heating up. But if you look at what's happened since then, you can see the Democrats, you know, staying roughly constant. You know, 70% uh, arguing for more spending on the environment. But Republican support for the environment tailing off dramatically. So that by 2012, only 40% of Republicans were saying that Spending on the environment was too little. Now, that's still 40% of Republicans, right? So, you know, it's a significant minority. It's dropped a little more, so we're maybe down to 35 or 30. But still, a third of Republicans, you know, are in favor of, of more spending on the environment. But the gap has really obviously increased from 10% gap throughout the uh, 70s into the 90s to a 30% gap now. Okay? So, we got a puzzle. What's going on? Why did this happen? Well, let's, let's spend a few minutes thinking about what was the conservative support for bipartisan environmental action? What was the basis for that back in the 70s and, and 80s? Why were some conservatives supporting action? And of course, there's obviously some kind of link here because you know, it's the same root word about conserve, right? Conservatives and conservation. And so in many ways, if you're conservative... Right? You would think of just the name, then, then you would think you'd want to conserve uh, because you wouldn't want to be wasteful. Right? And there is that sort of root dimension of the two philosophies. Um, so the, the, one of the big thrusts, and Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican, right, is that there's this sort of idea about sort of the outdoors being a breeding ground for manhood. Boy Scouts to, you know, sort of carries that idea down into the current era. Um, and womanhood, you know, it gets expanded to, to Girl Scouts. Um, uh, Republicans are hunters and fishers and farmers and ranchers, and so, you know, there was a conservation ethic that emerged out of that land experience. Um, uh, religious motivation. So some Republicans came at this from the perspective that we, uh, we are stewards of God's creation and we need to protect it and preserve it. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the first generation environmental problems very much in your face. Litter, water pollution, air pollution, very hard to argue with and pretty clear that something needed to be done. And then finally, the Republicans that were in office at the time all came out of the World War II generation, right? So these were folks that had grown up during the Great Depression, experienced World War II, um, had sort of, were sort of comfortable more or less, or much more comfortable than, than current day with conservatives were with, with government action. Um, this was an era before kind of the whole critique of big government, government is the problem, conservatism had not really arisen. There were people who believed that, Mary Goldwater and others, but it wasn't dominant in the party yet. Um, okay, so that's why conservatives supported action 
on the environment, but they clearly were less supportive than liberals. And so, you know, what were the concerns that Republicans were bringing to the table at the time? Well, one is that uh, the conservative perspective has been that, you know, the problem is not as bad as liberal sayings. Um, and that can be a legitimate critique, right? Environmentalists have been known to exaggerate the seriousness of the problem um, uh, because they feel it's serious. Uh, and the second critique was that, you know, f even if there was a problem, fixing it might cost too much, right? So it might require you know, higher prices for gasoline or electricity or food. And, you know, we have to sort of balance those costs that people have to pay uh, against, you know, the challenge of whatever environmental concern we have. Okay? And so that's why Republican support was less than liberal support um, during the bipartisan era, because they were more focused on these problems or these, these issues. Uh, and, you know, and, and um, but, but what's happened is, is that these critiques have morphed into the partisan area so we've gone from saying that the problem is not as bad as liberals say to saying that the problem does not exist, right? And this is the Donald Trump perspective that global warming is a total and very expensive no, hoax. So that's wrapping up the two critiques in one. Um, and, and it's not just Trump. Uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a very common uh, uh, argument uh, on the part of pretty much all the major national Republican candidates that... They don't, they may not say it's a hoax, but they'll say, well, we're not sure, we don't know, we don't think it's real, um, and that's the perspective. Um, and then the second issue is that, you know, fixing the problem costs too much has gone from that to fixing the problem would wreck the economy. Um, and this was Marco Rubio on the campaign trail. I can tell you with certainty that climate action, cap and trade, would have a devastating impact on our economy. Okay? Well, you know, if you believe that the problem doesn't exist, and you believe that doing something about it would wreck the economy, no point talking about it, right? There's just really no room for compromise there. So how, did, how do we get from these critiques to these more uh, sort of uh, um, non-negotiable critiques? Um, let's, let's look at the Republican Party in terms of the three big, or the three factions that are there right now. Um, and this will help answer that question. So, uh, and, and we'll represent them by the three men remaining at the end of the, the primary. So John Kasich from Ohio will represent the moderates. Uh, Ted, uh, Ted Cruz from um, Texas, the second group, the movement conservatives, and, and Donald Trump, the populists. Um, so Kasich isn't exactly a moderate on the environment, but I think he's most representative of that strand. Uh, and, and this is really kind of, the modern Republicans uh, really reflect or, or, or were made up of uh, kind of the backbone of what the Republican Party was during much of the 20th century, kind of a business party, party business, small business, big business, Wall Street, Main Street. Um, that was historically kind of what the Republican Party was viewed at. That was their, that was their core constituency. Um, and their main concern has always been about excessive tax increases and excessive regulations. Um, so they were not happy about environmental regulation, but, you know, they were moderates, and they also sort of carried those environmental concerns forward. And so they were kind of willing to compromise on the environment. Um, and more recently, they've been uh, supportive of immigration reform. All right. Uh, for two reasons. One is they're business folks, and they, they want, you know, low price labor. Um, but also, um, they, they see the Republican Party as future as being a big tent. Um, and, and that particularly needs to include Hispanics. So they didn't want to alienate sort of a growing demographic segment of the population. The second group are the movement conservatives. And um, I'm going to talk in a minute about sort of where these folks came from. But, uh, but basically, what the movement conservatives have done over the last couple of decades is they've been able to kind of unite the, the, fist, the moderates, the fiscal conservatives, uh, with the social conservatives in the party. Um, and they've done that by basically defining what a true conservative is. I just turned off my... Oh, there we go. Defining what a true conservative is around a series of policy issues, loyalty tests. Um, and 
Uh, and in particular, they attack the moderates as being insufficiently conservative. They have a label for the moderates, which they call a rhino. Does anyone know what a rhino is? A rhino? It's a Republican in name only. Okay, So that's what they call the moderates. And, and they basically say, unless you believe in all of this basket of policy proposals, you're not a true conservative. You're not a true movement conservative. And the policy uh, basket is, you guys know it, if you're a true conservative, you're in favor of cutting taxes, food stamps, and welfare, reducing environmental and safety regulations. We're going to talk about how that one got in there. Um, lowering the minimum wage, free trade, restricting abortion, rolling back gun regulations, privatizing Social Security and Medicare, and religious freedom to teach creationism, pray in schools, and to not marry, serve, or hire LGBT folks. Uh, and then finally, there's a strongly anti-elitist perspective among movement conservatives. Okay? And the elite include me, you know, I'm a social scientist, uh, academics, politicians, and the mainstream me. Now there's a strong anti-elitist perspective on the left as well, right? So Bernie Sanders, you know, was railing against the Wall Street banks um, uh, and, uh, and billionaires who, you know, from his perspective, you know, control the economy. Um, so anti-elitism kind of runs deep in American culture. We're, we're, we're Democrats. We don't like being told what to do by anybody. Uh, we're Democrats with a small D. Yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's very strong among movement conservatives. And you saw it last night with, with, with uh, Trump, uh, you know, attacking the, the media um, pretty heavily in the context of his debate. Um, okay. Um, and then, so, if you think about sort of how we got from bipartisan support for environmental regulations to uh, a partisan divide, it really reflects the rise of movement conservatism and the decline of, of, of the moderate conservatives in the Republican Party. Um, and there was just a dynamic that went on for about 20 years where, you know, movement conservatives would challenge moderate conservatives in primaries and say, you're not conservative enough, you're a rhino. And, and they would mobilize the base, and they would throw that person out, and one by one they would pick these guys off, and mostly they were guys, um, and replace them with more conservative folks who bought into this uh, idea that if you're a true conservative, you're opposed to environmental regulations and safety regulations, because it's just another example of the government uh, overstepping its boundaries and, uh, and strangling free enterprise, which was actually, you guys heard that last night in the debate from Trump, if you were listening, right? So very much kind of arguing that. Um, and that's, it went back and forth. Um, uh, but then suddenly this year, Trump emerged on the scene and kind of revitalized a third wing of the Republican Party, uh, what I'll call right-wing populists. Uh, right-wing populism has a history in American politics. George Wallace from the late 60s was probably the most prominent uh, advocate of it, started, ran as a third party candidate in 1968. Um, but the primary concern, and, and you see very, you see actually in Europe, uh, uh, right wing nationalist parties, populist parties like uh, Le Pen's party in France and the party that just won in Germany. Um, and, and what right wing populists say is that government is favoring immigrants and minorities at the expense of middle class, mostly white Americans. Um, and that unfair trade and military weakness are undermining American strength. Uh, and, and Trump hit the trade issue really, really, really hard last night, okay? Um, and they don't care, they don't, wanna, they don't want actually Social Security and Medicare privatized because those are so social support systems for the white middle class, right? That's their constituency. Um, and they really are much less concerned about religious social issues. I mean, it's just, that's not the big deal for them. It's mostly about um, about, about immigrants, minorities, trade, and, and military weakness. And you can see that this position really cuts against the movement conservatives, right? Because it's anti-immigrate. And this, because there's no statement about immigration here, right? Movement conservatives have always been danced around the immigration issue because they didn't want to alienate moderates. And they were also kind of worried about the long-run future of the party if it was purely... Uh, uh, if it had excluded Hispanics in particular. Um, but Trump really jumped on that because these folks weren't willing to talk about it uh, and, and really ran with it. 
and being uh, against trade deals, that really goes against the movement conservative support for free trade. Um, so, so Trump's really st stepped outside the boundaries on a number of issues uh, and kind of blown up what had been a consensus among conservatives that was sort of solidifying around this movement perspective. Feel free to stop me anytime. I mean, I can just go on and on. So if you've got any questions, raise your hands um, or let me know. Shout out. Okay, so where did movement conservatism come from? Right? What, where did, what's the genesis of this idea that you've got to be opposed to environmental and safety regulations if you're a true conservative? Well, we're going to start back again in 1970, when I was 10, 1971. And... Um, Movement conservatives really emerged as an opposition movement to ascendant liberalism. The 1960s were a great decade for liberals, right? We just had the civil rights movement, war in, uh, Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty, uh, you had all these environmental laws being passed, you had uh, taxes being increased, um, and, uh, and folks in the big business community were starting to get nervous that this was sort of like some version of American socialism that was going to choke out free enterprise. Um, and there was a guy named Lewis Powell, who later became a Supreme Court justice appointed by Richard Nixon, who kind of crystallized this line of thought in a memo that he wrote to the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in 1971. It's called the Powell Memo. And, and basically, this is what he said. I mean, conservatives are on the run. The free market system is under attack. Uh, we've got to figure out an ideology of conservatism that can fight back against liberal ideology. Um, and we got to do that, you know. That's the that's what that's the needs to be done. And this memo uh, caught the attention of some right wing rich folks who back then, you know, had hundreds of millions of dollars, and now they have billions of dollars. Um, and uh, and that included the Koch brothers, who got in the game at this time. But Scaife, Mellon, Coors, Olin, um, and these folks poured significant amounts of money hundreds of millions of dollars, into the creation of kind of a, a, a right-wing intellectual infrastructure. So they funded think tanks like the Cato and Hoover and Heritage Foundations, um, and they created media outlets, and they began to sort of try and define what it meant to be a conservative around these policy positions that I'm talking about. Um, and they began to create sort of arguments and policy arguments and white papers and talking heads and others who would begin to articulate a conservative ideology that could stand up against what liberals were shooting for. And all this came to fruition really pretty quickly in 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan, who sort of was an effective communicator and crystallized this around the government is the problem, conservatism. You know, that was what Reagan ran on. Big government is the problem. And pretty much ever since then, conservatives have been running on that mantra. Um, now, remember... At this time, Congress was still bipartisan around the environment. The environment was still mom and apple pie. Laws were getting passed. Reagan was signing them into law. But you were beginning to see sort of the emergence of an anti-environmentalist perspective in the Republican Party. And in particular, Reagan appointed a guy named James Watt to be his Secretary of the Interior. And Watt was very controversial, and he was actually fired for being so controversial. But he was really the first politician to step out and say, environmentalists are a bunch of elitists who are passing these laws that are strangling American business um, and, uh, and taking away your rights and your liberty. Okay? And that was his perspective, and he pushed it, and, and he lost a job. Uh, but that idea really took hold and began to be developed among this, in this conservative infrastructure. Um, and by 1994, it really come to fruition... Um, uh, this was uh, 1994, this was two years after Clinton was elected, there was a backlash election against him, and for the first time the Republicans took over the House of Representatives, first time in like 40 years or something like that. And at the time there was a fiery young congressman from Georgia uh, named Newt Gingrich, who you guys may know as a Fox News commentator with sort of white hair and he's kind of old guy now. But uh, he stood up on the steps of the White House, or not Congress, excuse me, with, what he, with the contract of America, with America, he was waiting there. And the contract with America, one of the planks of the contract with America is we're going to replace, we're going to roll back and replace 1970s, 1980s, 1990s environmental regulation because it's government overreach. And we need to replace it with 
environmental rules that are more friendly for business. And ever since then, that has been kind of a key plank in the movement conservative um, platform. Um, now, this perspective um, got reinforced during the 1990s as we had the emergence of media bubbles, and you guys I'm sure are familiar with this, this idea that these days, you know, with the internet, you can just sort of read the news you want to read and you don't have to pay attention to what folks you don't disagree, folks you disagree with are saying. So we had the emergence of talk radio with Rush Limbaugh and then Fox News and then with the internet, Drudge and Breitbart and others on the right. You know, similar, maybe less extreme versions on the left with, you know, uh, MSNBC and some lesser kind of left-wing talk radio shows. Um, so that kind of allowed people to really begin to buy into this, these idea, ideological positions um, and not feel threatened by them. And then in the late 90s, uh, you had another surge of big business concern about the potential for a new wave of environmental regulation around climate change. Because you had Clinton and Gore in office, you had the Kyoto Treaty being signed, and so you had the formation of a big business coalition that included the fossil fuel industries, car companies, actually lobbying actively to oppose any new climate regulation and using these arguments about how environmentalists were overreaching and, and restricting people's liberties. Um, that fell apart under pressure in the early 2000s, but then the Koch brothers and Exxon and others stepped in with some you know, dark money funding and, and really sort of, again, sort of spread the wealth around a bunch of NGOs and think tanks and others that were sort of promoting this anti-environmentalist idea and, and really sowing confusion around consensus climate science. In spite of all that, at the top of the Republican Party, you had a continued commitment to sort of the moderate perspective. So if you look at the two Republican candidates in 2008, McCain and Romney, both of them had actually been quite active in leadership and action for action on climate change. McCain had proposed a number of, of bills to uh, uh, cap uh, carbon emissions in the U.S. Senate, and Romney had been supportive of cap and trade when he was governor of uh, Massachusetts. So, um, and, and they sustained that perspective up through the 2008 election. Um, but uh, after 2008, when Obama was elected, and in particular after 2010, when you had the backlash election and the Tea Party gained control of the House of Representatives, that moderation disappeared. And it stopped being safe for any Republicans to step out on the climate issue in particular. And McCain went silent, just has never said a word about climate change pretty much since then. And Romney officially backtracked on the issue in 2012, and became an opponent of climate action, even though he'd been supportive of it back in 2008 and, and prior. Okay? So pretty much by 2010 election, you had total victory uh, of the movement conservatives over the moderates at the national level. Uh, and if you looked at, for example, the 2016 field of Republican presidential candidates, of the 17 people who were running, there was only one who would argue for action on climate change. That was Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. So there was only one Republican who was still hanging on to that traditional moderate perspective on the environment. Everybody else, oh, you know, the science is too vague, we can't do anything, it'll wreck the economy. Pretty much everybody else had bought into the movement conservative language. And then along came Trump. Um, because basically the movement conservatives were like, wow, 2016 is going to be our year. We've got a deep bench, we've got great candidates. Uh, we think Hillary Clinton's going to be a weak opponent. We can get the Senate, the House, the presidency, and we can really enact our agenda. Um, but then sort of Trump emerged and kind of scrambled the whole game. <clears throat> so that's what happened on the right. What happened on the left? Did somehow the environment become more of a left-wing issue in some way? Uh, uh, and um, one thing that happened was that Culturally, sort of the, the cultural environment changed, right? So that if you were a, a conservative environmentalist back in 1992, you would have had friends and organizations and places you would have felt comfortable hanging out. Um, but today, if you were a conservative environmentalist and you 
you know, you wanted to go to an environmental policy program or you want to uh, uh, go work in Washington, D.C. on climate change issues, you know, you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of progressives who are going to be, you know, in favor of abortion rights and, you know, uh, and, and want to tax rich folks and, you know, uh, supportive of gay marriage. And, you know, so you're just going to feel very lonely. Um, and this is, a, this is a real problem. Uh, there's sort of no cultural space for conservatives in, on the environmental movement. Uh, the second thing is that the second generation environmental challenge is climate change, ozone depletion. These are not local for most people, rainforest uh, destruction, you know, in the U.S. I mean, they're obviously local for people on the front lines, but most people are not directly affected. Or if they are, <clears throat> it's not. The cause and effect is not obvious. So you're in Louisiana and you're you know, you're flooded out, or you're in California, and you're losing your home, so forest fires. <clears throat> the scientists are telling you that, you know, these events have been made much more likely by climate change, but you don't see it, you know. Uh, so what this has done is that it's created, it's, it's, it's pushed environmental issues into the arena of science. Um, and so these are now scientific-based uh, sort of claims about why things are happening. And, and this subjects uh, environmental questions to sort of all kinds, it makes them wide open for anti-elitism. Right. You know, oh, this is just a bunch of scientists who are, uh, you know, liberal scientists who are, you know, conspiring to raise more money by being alarmist. Um, and, and that really is a meme in the Fox News, Rush Limbaugh world. I mean, if you're a conservative politician, you're hearing this from trusted sources all the time, so you start to believe it, or you feel very comfortable saying it in public. Okay, um, so that's that's certainly a, a challenge uh, 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 that's that's enabled this kind of divide to happen. And then finally, and I think this one's very real, is that there are concerns that really addressing climate change and these other second generation global challenges is going to necessitate widespread global, widespread government control of the economy. Um, that, you know, capitalism and the climate are inconsistent. And um, when we can talk about this. I mean, I don't think this is true. Uh, but you don't have to go far if you're a conservative to find environmentalists who are saying this. So Naomi Klein is one of the most popular kind of campus speakers on climate issues. She wrote a book called... Um, this changes everything. And the subtitle is Capitalism versus the Climate. So if you're a conservative and you're a strong believer in free trade and free markets because you think that that's the best avenue for advancing human prosperity and you think it also is the best safeguard against of your, of your liberty, um, and you're saying, I have to choose between capitalism and the climate, you say, well, I think I'll take capitalism, thank you. You know, <laughs> those are the choices, right? Uh, so... <coughs> This kind of uh, language make, does make it difficult for people who want to step out and say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a conservative, but I'm also worried about the climate. Because then you're going to get, oh, you're not, you can't be a conservative because you're in, you're in bed with all these eco-socialists. Right? So let's just summarize. Okay, how did, how did, how did this big spread in public opinion emerge? Um, well, really, it started as a backlash against... Ascendant liberalism in the 60s. You had wealthy donors and corporations creating a movement conservative infrastructure uh, that began to solidify and bring together all these conservative policy positions to define what a true conservative was. And into that basket, uh, opposition to environmental regulation was placed, and it began to emerge as a core uh, to the conservative identity. Um, you couldn't be a conservative anymore if you supported action on the climate or environment. Yet media bubbles reinforcing uh, movement conservative and progressive identities. Uh, you had the scale of climate solutions to really address the problem, raising concerns about further government overreach, eco-socialism. Um, and then you had anti-elitism fueling rejection of consensus climate science. And you had dollars flowing in from the Koch brothers and others to support climate confusion um, and, and allow politicians to get away with it. And then finally, 
gerrymandering 2010, we could talk about that, uh, has made it even harder to uh, have a bipartisan conversation. So <clears throat> that's where we are. That's, the, that's how we got from bipartisan cooperation to partisan gridlock. Um, can we get it back? I mean, is, is there a way we can rebuild a centrist kind of conversation about the need for action on climate? And this, my thinking about this has evolved um, as the Trump phenomenon has evolved. And I think that as long as Trump is kind of in the news on a daily basis, the answer is no. Um, and uh, so I think we need to think sort of post-Trump. What does this mean? And post-Trump could happen in six weeks or it could happen in five years. You know, uh, those are the two sort of those are the post-Trump scenarios, and we'll know, right? Six weeks, we'll know whether it's six weeks or, or five years. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that, and I'll talk about what a Trump victory would mean for the environment in a few minutes, because um, it basically means the triumph of the movement conservative uh, agenda around environmental issues, but. Um, if we're going to see the return to some sort of centrist engagement on the issue, we know where it's going to come from, right? Um, we've got young evangelicals uh, who are otherwise socially conservative uh, adopting a creation care ethos um, and beginning to argue that, uh, that they're conservatives, but they want action on climate change. Uh, we've got, uh, you always have in the background kind of the big conservation groups in Washington, D.C. who have constituencies of hunters and fishers and others who are probably ready to play you know, if it becomes safe. Uh, you've got lots of military folks and CIA folks stepping up and saying, you know, global warming is a threat multiplier. It's, it's a destabilizing uh, thing. We have to deal with it. And this is a source of authority in conservative circles. Energy self-reliance. This is a place where the right and the left actually circle back together. Everybody hates the utilities. Um, and you had in Georgia recently this recent phenomenon of, of, of where Tea Party activists and Sierra Club activists got together to fight back a utility effort to make it harder to put solar on your roof, called the Green Tea Alliance, right? Um, and because uh, neither of them, they both, everybody wants that energy self-reliance. Um, business sustainability. Now, this is a new area that's emerged. Over the last 15 years, You've had increasing numbers of big businesses. Every big business has got a sustainability director now. And these are folks who are trying to say, look, there doesn't have to be a conflict between you know, reducing our carbon footprint and making money. Um, and, and that's creating a source of business support for action on climate change and environmental issues. Uh, and we had a really interesting example, a rare example of bipartisanship at the end of this year, last year, where... Um, uh, Conservatives and Democrats agreed to extend, Republicans and Democrats agreed to extend the uh, uh, tax credits for renewable energy for five years. Most people thought this would be a horrible partisan fight, but actually they cut a deal. Uh, the Republicans got a, 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 a removal of the ban on oil export, and the Democrats got the renewable tax credit extended. Um, but many Republicans were willing to step across the aisle to vote for this because especially in, uh, in many red states, wind power in particular has become a big economic development opportunity. Um, and, and solar is emerging as that. So you can sidestep the climate issue and just say, well, just from a jobs perspective, these are industries that you know, are worthy uh, of support, and that's gaining bipartisan um, traction. Technology leadership, uh, market-friendly solutions, uh, and again, uh, Here's how I see this shaking out. Like, if Trump loses, then, I mean, the moderates have pretty much have been silenced, right, in the Republican Party. But if Trump loses, then you're going to have sort of a, a fight between the right-wing populists uh, who are going to circle the wagons around kind of anti-immigrant uh, 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 and anti-trade uh, sort of rhetoric. Uh, 
And the move the conservative folks, represented by Ted Cruz and many of the other candidates who ran, were going to try and sort of just resurrect that agenda of what true conservatism is and say Trump's not a conservative, right? Um, and, and there's going to have to be a sort of fight to the death on that one. Um, and it may just really marginalize the Republican Party. I mean, uh, what's interesting about this election is that there's going to be a lot of... In the old days, or until recently, not in the old days, until recently, Democrats would get a good share of the, of the uh, uh, white vote of folks without college education. And Republicans would tend to do well in, in the college-educated suburbs. Those college-educated suburbans are actually moving to Hillary, and Trump's picking up uh, the white folks without... Uh -oh, without a college education. And so you could just begin to see sort of people getting really disgusted with that fight within the Republican Party and either becoming apolitical or else moving into the Democratic center and, and sort of there being just a space for a resurrection of a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of centrist, we need to do something about the environment kind of perspective that's been squashed um, given the dominance of movement conservatives. Um, I don't see the moderates regaining a voice in the Republican Party any kind of soon. Um, uh, just because of the dynamic that's going to happen. But I do see the possibility of those folks pretty much just leaving the Republican Party um, and, and beginning to have a dialogue among themselves about the need for action on the environment and climate. Um, so th I think that's the most likely scenario if Trump loses. If he wins, let's talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, there's this, right? I mean, this is ultimately going to drive a, a, a centrist consensus around the need for action on climate change. Okay, so, you know, this is the Earth heating up over the last 100 years, uh, uh, about 2 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see 2016 is just... You know, it's just going off the charts, hot. You know, it's been really hot the last few weeks. You might have noticed for, for the fall. I mean, that's a reflection of the fact that we're living in the hottest year on record. Um, and it's going to keep going, and this is ultimately going to drive action. Now, it doesn't happen in 2020 or 2024 or 2028. Who knows? But this ultimately is going to drive some kind of centrist response for action. So let me end this, con this part of the talk on uh, this slide. Um, this guy is named Bob Inglis, and he was uh, a Republican congressman from South Carolina. Very conservative, evangelical, uh, you know, great ratings from all the conservative voting groups, with one exception, which is that uh, out of a creation care sort of um, ethic, uh, he became persuaded that climate change was real, and he's also a scientist, uh, and, uh, and was an advocate for action of climate change in the Republican Party, and he actually voted in favor of a uh, cap-and-trade uh, bill that was passed in the House in 2008. It's one of a dozen Republicans who voted for it. He was challenged in 2010 by a Tea Party candidate uh, on the basis of him being a rhino, because he voted for this climate bill. He lost. Um, and he subsequently went on to start an a, a NGO called Republic N. And let me just read what their website says. We opened up shop in July 2012. For our first couple of years, we spoke with thousands of conservatives and free market advocates around the country. We discovered that a robust constituency exists for conservative leadership on clean energy and climate change. We met a lot of conservatives who shared three things in common. Number one, they're energy optimists, confident that market-driven innovation can accelerate an energy revolution. So they don't see a conflict between climate and capitalism. They think they see capitalism as being the solution to climate. They're climate realists, compelled by the evidence that climate risk requires risk management, so they want to focus on climate change as an issue that needs addressing. And they're pumped to learn that they're not all alone. Right. So this is this cultural thing. If we're going to get a return to sort of a centrist dialogue, there has to be a cultural space where centrists can kind of claim this issue. Um, and they, that has to be recreated. Uh, and, uh, you know... They're working on it to try and figure out how to bring these disparate conservative or moderate voices together to, uh, to sort of claim the issue. 
So let's talk about Trump uh, and Clinton. Uh, the two, the one, one issue on the environment side is just climate, right? And will the U.S. meet the Paris climate commitments? We are committed to 30% reductions uh, in pollution, global warming pollution below 2006 levels by 2030. That's what Obama committed us to. And uh, Clinton would get us on track for that. There's no question about that. Um, Trump said he would cancel the accord. It's not clear what that means, but clearly there would be no effort to, to meet the, uh, the, the targets, especially given that he thinks it's, it's a hoax. Um, and, uh, but probably more important than that is that in 2020, all of the parties are supposed to come back to the table um, uh, with deeper reductions. To get us, right now we're on track to 6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is deep reductions that would get us on track to 4 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, this is, it's pretty clear that Trump wouldn't do that, Clinton would do that. Um, and if the U.S. doesn't show up in 2020, you know, the Chinese won't show up, the Indians won't show up, the Europeans won't show up, right? So Trump's election would scuttle the entire future of global climate uh, uh, negotiations. So there's a huge amount of writing on this election, which... I mean, I understand why millennials are disengaged, but uh, there's probably never been a more, there hasn't been a more important election in the United States for some very, very long period of time. Um, in part because of this, but also if you just think about environmental issues in general, now that's not going to happen. When I first wrote the slides, that was a possibility, but not going to happen. This could happen, right? If Trump wins, he's going to have a Republican Senate, he's going to have a Republican House, and it will be the opportunity that conservatives have been waiting for since 1994 with the contract with America to really go in there and roll back. And Trump was very clear last night. That's what he wanted to do, was to cut regulations. Um, and the uh, defunding or, or elimination of the EPA is likely. The Republican um, uh, platform calls for the replacing of the EPA with a bipartisan commission. So it would be placed under direct political control. Uh, rather than being an independent agency. Um, and uh, a rollback of, of existing regulations, very likely. So if we had Trump plus Republican Congress, I mean, this legislation has been written. It's ready to go. It could pass in a month. I mean, I don't think Trump really cares. He wouldn't veto it. So we could have a complete remaking of the environmental regulatory system and, you know, much more pro-business uh, within a few months uh, of the Trump administration. So again, huge stakes in this election. Student vote's going to be decisive, um, and, uh, and, and Hillary's very struggling very much, actually, in this space. So uh, Obama had 67% versus Romney's 33%, and it, was, it got him into the White House. Um, so the final, you know, because the environment is so highly partisan, if either party was to get in with presidency plus majority in Congress, big change. Uh, and if we're really going to do something about climate change, Hillary's going to be, have her hands tied because of, she's not going to have the House and Senate. Um, so she'll be limited in what she can do. She can probably go to Paris with some deeper reduction cuts under existing law. But if we're just going to get serious about this, ultimately we're going to have to have a centrist consensus around the need for action. Maybe not bipartisan. What you do if you care, well, you know, get out there, register to vote, uh, and uh, get your friends to vote. Um, especially if you live in Florida. <laughs> Uh, but there's probably some important votes around, races around here. Uh, so um, thanks for having me here tonight. I mean, I, you know, I, I'll just end on this note. If we're, you know, the whole environmental sort of questions can get overwhelming and daunting because of the scale of the challenges that we face. And so it really requires young people who are just ready to really reimagine the future and think about radical redesign of the way we do things. And that's what we're about at BARD. Um, uh, you know, we've got some students who want to change the rules, figure out policy for a new economy. Some who want to transform the game, figure out how to grow sustainable businesses. So that's what we spend our time doing. And uh, if you're thinking about graduate school, please think about us. And I'm glad to have a conversation with you about that, um, as well as take other questions. So thanks for the conversation. Uh, well.
well, Bob Inglis does. Yeah. So, so what you do is just basically peel out that one stick, right? And you can be, you can have all the other sticks you want. You know, you can, you know, want to have, continue to have, you know, religious freedom to not serve higher LGBT folks. You can, you know, be totally about free markets and want to reduce the minimum wage and uh, uh, privatize Social Security and Medicare. All those things. You can, and then you can still be supportive of action on climate change and protecting the environment. But if you really care about the environment, wouldn't you align yourself with a party that puts up as a priority? Well, no. What you can do is, because you have these other values you hold too, right? Um, and so you can say, these are values to me, and I want to, I want my party to move back to where we used to be, which is only eight years ago, supporting action for climate change. So there's this long tradition of conser otherwise conservative folks being in favor of action to support the environment. And you can just say, look, Mitt Romney, you know, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, all these conservatives, they care about the environment, that's where we need to get back to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's maybe, <coughs> sorry, more speculative, but you sort of see it gerrymandering as an issue. Yeah. And I'm just wondering <coughs> if you had a sense of how long will that slow progress? Because it, there are so many safe seats yeah. now, and yeah. there's so many who play to a certain audience yeah. that it's change, you know, sort of change is certainly the house. So, I've, got, I've got a gerrymandering slide in here, I think, a second. Yeah. Um, does everybody know what gerrymandering is? It's the creation of safe districts. So look at, here's one. This is Chicago, right, at the top. And you can see Chicago is the white space in the middle, and the black space surrounding it are the, uh, the suburbs, Chicago suburbs. So what gerrymandering does is you kind of say, let's create a district in the middle there that's 90% Democratic. Okay, and then let's create a district around the rim that's let's say sixty percent Republican. Okay, so both of those are safe seats. The one around the outside is always going to go Republican. The one around the inside is always going to go Democrat. Okay, and what if that's true? Then the primary becomes the election, and folks who can appeal to the base are going to win. So it's going to create much more partisan dialogue than if you had fifty-fifty districts where you had to like win the, the middle. Okay. So gerrymandering was done pretty extremely by the Republicans in 2010 because it it's done every two years they redistrict. So in 2010 they gained control of a lot of state houses and using GPS technology and sort of sophisticated analytics they were able to create these districts that were really safe. Okay. And by <clears throat> packing Democratic districts 90% Democrat and Republican districts 60% Republican you could also wind up with more House seats than you otherwise would because you're spreading your Republican votes out and you're concentrating the Democratic votes. Okay? So in the 2012 election, uh, you know, Democrats got like 1.5 million more votes for House seats than Republicans did, but they, Republicans won more, more seats because of this gerrymander. There's, another, there's an opportunity to un-gerrymander in 2020. So it's going to, 2020 is going to be a very critical election on that space. And you've got to gain control of the House legislatures. And then in California, they basically just chop the state up into blocks. You know, very un-gerrymandered. Um, and it was, I think it might have been a, was it a ballot measure that required that? Yeah. yeah, that was the plan, was to make it a ballot measure and to try to take the politics out of the gerrymandering. Yeah, and they, and they did it. So you can do this. You can absolutely just eliminate gerrymandering and just create straight up 50-50 districts or whatever, however they fall. Um, and so 2020 is going to be a really important election to undo as much of this stuff as is as possible um, to create opportunity to have a more um, representative uh, House of Representatives. Other questions? Comments? Thoughts? You guys are engaged in the election, thinking about it. How did you feel after the debate last night? I mean, it's kind of, an, I, I, I'm just curious. I mean, it, it, I, 
if there was a Trump supporter here, would you be willing to raise your hand? It's very intimidating, right? You know, this is part of the reflection of the partisan polarization is that, you know, if you're a Trump supporter, you think, I'm not going to that talk. It's, you know, some liberal, right? And so you don't even get that dialogue at the university level um, that you should be getting. Yeah? It's interesting that you were talking about how the millennial voting says how 40%. Yeah. Honestly, like, I feel like I know some of my peers that they're very politically minded. Yeah. I feel like the younger millennials, maybe? I don't know if that's a thing. I think this is, you're, you guys are in a bit of a bubble. You know, you're more engaged than most. Um, and then there's a lot of support for Stein and uh, Johnson, is that uh, as well, it's sort of a protest vote. But I was talking to somebody at like a big, where was I, big state school, Albany, studio Albany, and they said, yeah, all my friends are independents, you know, and because they don't want to join the party, you know, they want to be independent. Independent used to mean, I'm going to vote, but I'm going to not decide which, you know, I'm going to withhold the right to vote Republican or Democrat. Now independent means I'm independent, so I don't vote. Uh, that's what I was told, uh, you know, at that, in, that, in that environment. So, but good to hear, you know, and spread the bubble, you know. And it may pick up. I mean, it may be that at the end of the day, people are going to get motivated and decide they need to vote. I think it could just be how critical is election. Well, yeah, if that gets through. I mean, I think a lot of people have decided that it's, you know, pox on both houses and they vote the same, you know. Uh, because of the way the conversation has been going. Other questions? So I'm not cheery <laughs> Well, I mean, cheery. I, you know, we, we're going to deal with this. And, you know, it, like, the Trump phenomenon is sort of gobsmacking for anybody, you know, for all people who've been around for 40 years. Uh, just kind of the level of, of uh, 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 um, I mean, just, and, and again, I, I don't want to be partisan here. I mean, you, if you just sort of look at how many times he said things last night that were just patently not true, and it's kind of, it's a, it's, it's a situation where we moved out of the norms of, politi- of normal political dialogue, I guess. And, um, and it may be that that's, we needed that to kind of shake us up out of our lethargy and sort of create space, like I think he has actually created space, for a different conversation. Um, I hope we can recapture those norms of sort of, you know, truth-telling and at least within limits and uh, civility in politics. Um, But the thing about politics is that it never stays the same. And it's hard to believe that, you know, if you're like young, it's like it seems like it's been like this forever. But... You know, I remember the Bush years where it seemed like nothing was going to happen. Then we had Obama, and there was like, you know, the economy was going to crash, and then it revived. And so over the space of years, even five or six years, things shift and morph in ways that you just can't imagine. So what may seem like sort of really horrible right now and sort of gross and, you know, it's going to, something will be different tomorrow. It's going to be different. And you just have to be ready to think about, okay, it's going to shift. Man, it'll be good, maybe worse. Uh, but it, it's going to be different, and so you have to figure out, okay, how do how do I work within that space to get done what needs to get done? Okay, thank you. Um,